Um, let me start with my presentation and um, I hope that sharing the screen will work. Um, hopefully this shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So um, the title is a bit different as you can see and I'll say something about that later. Um, a bit different from what I originally suggested, but this is where my current thoughts have been taking me. And this is um, a more of a philosophical speculation. So I'd like to provoke us into thinking about the role of time, both cinematic time and historical time in animation. I contend that like other genres of the moving image, animation often has at its core the obsolescence of the image, an anticipated, even planned obsolescence of the image. I hone in on animation pieces that point toward the moment where the medium disappears. So one split second, it's there. The next one, it's gone. Film relies on this ephemerality of perception as images succeed each other 24 per times per second or even faster. The transition from one frame to the next is what allows for animation in particular, designing one frame at a time and animating the image by showing what the frames in sequence. In that sense, animation is bound to the scale of the frame. However, we may also think at other magnitudes, especially in the digital age. At the size of the entire work, what matters is the speed with which the film hurtles toward its inevitable end, and possibly toward an afterlife in reproduced and redistributed forms. In blown up displays in which the single pixel is visible, the image expires also at the resolution of the pixel, many times within each frame. Animation works have played with calibrating these proportions up and down much more than we have credited them for. So um, here's one of the pieces that made me, uh, that set me on the path of thinking uh, this six minute, 40 seconds animation is titled Fly High, Time Flies. It was designed by Laurent Mignonneau and Krista Zomerer and exhibited over Hong Kong's ICC building between May 20th and July 4th, 2016, as part of the so-called Open Sky Project helmed by Maurice Benayoun at the City University of Hong Kong. So here's how the artists describe the piece. Our times are characterized by transients, impermanence, and change. The computer-generated sequence Fly High Time Flies is composed of a swarm of artificial flies. They slowly appear, propagate, and gradually invade the whole ICC tower before flying away again. Short swarming sequences and text messages with various plays on words around the terms fly, flies, may, sky, high, times, and life will appear. These messages remind us of the ephemeral moment, just like a mayfly, they symbolize time passing by. All of that was a quotation by, from the uh, description of the artists of this piece that's called Fly High Time, Time Flies, which I think matches beautifully content with form. The wordplay associates the high rise with flies flying high, flies that fly like time flies. But it's not just the written messages that convey time passing by. The artwork uses the unique specifications of the ICC facade, a monochrome display 
at a very low resolution. From top to bottom, there are only 140 lines positioned roughly four meters apart. Each pixel is an LED the size of a small TV screen. The display is equivalent to uh, 359 by 783 pixels um, on the three used faces of the tower. Um, at any given moment, a single fly is represented by one or two pixels. It's easy to ignore the reference to flies and see the animation as an abstract display, even more so as swarms fly in and out, at times lighting almost the entire building, like right now, uh, or alternatively leaving it darkened against the night sky. Fly high time flies brings the medium to the surface reducing the animation to light and dark, being and non-being. A similar, even more abstract game of shadows is found in another work that was part of the 2016 Open Sky Gallery, namely City Paths. Um, City Paths, sorry. Yeah, that's good, actually. Let me go back to this. Um, City Paths effectively creates the illusion that the ICC tower is pulsating and gyrating. Urban screens have often aimed at this effect of liquid architecture, an effect that Nana Verhoof describes as an almost literal blending of material and virtual spaces. The creators of City Paths state that the geometric lines and flows reflect the pulsating energy of Hong Kong. The animation alludes to the fleeting nature of urban life in a purely mediated form of light and dark. I'm going to return to the Open Sky project in this talk and I'm going to explain it. Um, but for now, I'm just noting how some works of animation place their at their core, the ephemerality of existence, down to signaling the death of the moving image. Paola Voci um, has asked us to think um, how post-digital animation, sorry, let me start again. Paola Voci has asked us to think about how post-digital animation may return to the early Chinese conception of film as electric shadows. Voci writes, today's animateurs engage with the digital medium, but reclaim the same de-technologized human dexterity, tangible materiality, and ev evocative imagina imaginative space of other kinetic and kinesthetic practices, such as manually constructed evocative silhouettes of shadow play. Indeed, animation, at least in forms other than CGI, preserves a proximity to its material means of production. For Voci, animation is therefore a more tactile, embodied form of cinema. Yet what Fly High Time Flies and City Paths, these two um, works that I've just showed, what these uh, show us is that animation can also signal a radical departure from concrete space and concrete time. The cinematic screen, even if it's one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world, can melt into air. And with it, the cinematic image. The figure of death in cinema has been foregrounded by the transition to digital and new media. Laura Mulvey has written an amazing essay titled Passing Time, included in this book. Mulvey notes that with the advent of a video in the late 1970s, and even more so with digital technology, the frame and the clip 
became more accessible for manipulation. Consequently, the viewing experience often relies on watching frozen and repeated images. Mulvey writes, as the new stillness is enhanced by the weight that the cinema's past has acquired with the passing time, its significance goes beyond the image itself toward the problem of time, its passing, and how it is represented or preserved. At a time when new technologies seem to hurry ideas and their representations at full tilt toward the future to stop and to reflect on the cinema and its history also offers the opportunity to think about how time might be understood within wider contested patterns of history and mythology. The delayed cinema gains, gains further significance as outside events hasten the disappearance of the past and strengthen the political appropriation of time. I should have warned you that this is a rather long quote from Mulvey and um, there are many issues to pick up here and I'm going to pick some of them out. Uh, let's remember that Mulvey is not actually talking about um, animation, especially, or even thinking about animation here. Um, she's also not thinking much about um, spectatorship in uh, terms other than the single idealized viewer. But within these terms, there is a lot to pick out here. Mulvey connects here two kinds of cinematic temporality and expiration. One is the obsolescence of the single frame, for which she titles her book, Death 24 Times a Second. The other kind of um, temporality is the gap between the time of production and the time of exhibition, a growing film historical chasm. Mulvey does not give thought to animation. In fact, she defines all cinema as quote, the mechanical animation of the inanimate. And yet Mulvey's comments are especially relevant for my discussion, both because of her contention that the frame at the, as the basic cinematic building brick portends the death of the image. So the frame as the building block of animation perhaps, and because she tags the attention to historical and from historical time as political. And this is an issue that I'll get back to uh, toward the end of my talk. Before I return to the light shows at the ICC Tower, I'd like to turn to animation incorporating found images and found footage. So I'll start with one of the most celebrated pieces of Chinese animation in recent years, namely Lei Lei and uh, Thomas Sauvin's Recycled of 2012. Curators, critics, and scholars have acknowledged the importance of this piece, yet surprisingly little analysis has been offered. The concept behind Recycled is pretty simple. Lay and Sauvin found discarded color photo negatives at a recycling repository on Beijing's outskirts. They scanned over half a million of them and chose 3,000 photos for the animation, which is running at uh, real speed in front of you. It's, uh, it's not that I'm just uh, showing you a psychedelic uh, vision by fast forwarding it. This is what it looks like. In five and a half minutes, the images are placed in a strip at the center of the screen. Notice how the strip is moving here. Two or three photos at a time and are replaced in rapid succession. The images are organized by locations, people photographed or themed so that there is a continuity both across the screen and between the images that replace each other. So some have commented on the content of this piece. Um, it 
culls a collective memory of life around the turn of the century, appropriating images by people who will mostly remain anonymous. It is an archive of an official history of Beijingers' everyday activities and sites they visited. To this, I would add, Recycled is a record of grassroots image making using unprofessional cameras to frame personal events. A segment is dedicated to photos at Tiananmen Square. And as I've discussed, discussed in a, an essay published a long time ago in 2010, the square, the Tiananmen Square that is, gave rise to multiple genres of photography, taking advantage of the tension between state symbolism and individual memory. One such genre was that of taking a photo while holding up an older photo, obvious, uh, consciously reflecting on the creation of memory through visual media. Recycled, the piece we're watching right now, is imbued with a sense of the passing of personal time and collective history. Now, what is missing, what seems to be missing from discussions of recycled is the formal insistence on the ephemerality of the photographic medium and the role of animation in mediating this transience. The photos are often blemished, faded, overexposed, and even chemically deteriorated to the point that they show only abstract patterns, that is right there, demonstrating the precarity of images. Each photo is presented as part of a strip moving horizontally as if it were a frame in a movie film. The final effect suggests that Lay and Sauvin have strong film frames back together in fact, these are completely disparate still images that have been collaged into an animation. I'd like to dwell on a few points here. First, in line with Voci's observation, Ley and Sauvin's animation restores the sense of a material, analog, tactile medium. The animators introduce the animation with showing only the perforated margins of the film. Second, the images are shown to be already expired insofar as their original intent is concerned. They have been discarded and recycled. Animation entails in this case reuse after the death of the image, not preservation, but indeed recycling into a different image in a different genre and with different purposes. Third, the animation is created through collage work, not just any concatenation of one still after another, but rather placing next to each other and after each other unrelated images, creating a new context. The collage forces us to consider how little the digital remediation truly gives the photos a new life. Instead, we must acknowledge animation as a Frankensteinian stitching together of dead parts of expired images. Recycled, this work points to the blurry distinction between the medias and genres including animation, photographic collage, and video using found footage. There is a continuum between, say, Hong Hao's found object photographic collages in My Thing. Um, we see here a video of it, but it's actually just a photographic collage. So there's a continuum between this, um, something like this, Yang Yong Liang's um, animated collages of cityscapes, and Xu Bing's Dragonfly Eyes, a movie that appropriates and stitches together surveillance camera footage. These and many other works recycle found materials. 
the act of recycling into collage is a form of animation, even if not in the strict sense that we, for whatever reason, insist on. The connection to recycling can be the topic of an entire presentation, which was in fact what I originally was going to talk about today. Now, all these genres coalescing to comment on the obsolescence of the image. Is this just a happy coincidence? Well, no, what I'm getting at is that digital modes of production and digital conditions of consumption of the image, these conditions add to the sense of, a, of the precarity of time and space for reasons ranging from the technology of new media to the politics of historical representation, digitally manipulated time and space are perceived as on the verge of expiration. To better understand the connection between time, space, and the digital media, I'd like to return now to the animation light shows on the ICC facade. But I'll have to take a sip of tea before I continue. Sorry about that. Okay. The fact that these animations, the animations on the ICC facade took place on a supersized screen visible from around Hong Kong facilitate my argument. The ICC facade calls to mind Paul Virilio's observation that the immediacy of, com of communication annihilates the perception of space. Digital urbanism disrupts the corporeal indexicality of space. As buildings double as screens, the material city gives way to the architecture of digital circuits. Thus, any image that makes use of the digital facade is likely to suggest that time and space no longer function in the same way. Now, um, this is a happy circumstance that I'm giving this talk um, mostly to people in Hong Kong, but um, as a reminder of what we're talking about. Uh, ICC, that is the Hong Kong International Commerce Center, is a 118 story, 484 meter tall building in West Kowloon. Completed in 2011, it is the tallest in Hong Kong and one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world. ICC was designed from the very beginning to show off its curtain wall structure by integrating LED lighting along its four facades. Now the northern uh, face is shut off permanently just to avoid light pollution. The display surface covers a total of 77,000 square meters. To date, the Guinness World Record holder for the largest light and sound show on a single building, more than twice that of the famed Burj Khalifa. The entire building serves as a giant screen with Hong Kong as an open air theater for the spectacle. Wonder what. Um, um, uh, Joe Xiaoshu will have to say about that. Uh, ICC's height and location near the waterfront makes it um, visible around town and across the bay. ICC is not only Hong Kong's most prominent piece of architecture, but also uh, the city's flagship platform for urban art. The ICC facade was part of the Hong Kong of Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government's support of public art to brand the city as a world city and regional hub. In the mid in the mid 2010s, in particular uh, from the umbrella movement of 2014 to crackdowns following the 2016 election, Hong Kong public spaces were a vibrant, if tense, arena for creative art. Against this background, a collaboration arose between two renowned Hong Kong-based new media artists, 
Jeffrey Shaw and Maurice Benayoun. And in 2012, Benayoun established a collaboration between the City University of Hong Kong, ICC, um, or the company that owns this building, the Hong Kong Arts Development Council, and in 2016 also with the International Symposium of Electronic Art. This project, the Open, uh, the Open Sky Project, exhibited short works especially designed for the ICC facade for three rounds, three annual rounds between 2014 and 2016. The curatorial principles paid attention to the medium and stated, among other requirements, these are the curatorial uh, requirements for um, anybody who wanted to pr uh, propose a project for the Open Sky project. So among other requirements, uh, they stated that the design should convey texture and depth on the mon monochromatic display and that the artists should consider, quote, the rhythm of the movement across the screen since static images or text aren't as suitable due to the low display resolution, end quote. So from the outset, the Open Sky Project was intended as an intervention in the symbiosis between built environment and media. The project produced dozens of engaging works uh, based on all possible techniques from hand-drawn animation to computer graphics and to photographed videos. Um, I've already described Fly High Time Flies and City Paths. Among other notable animations was The Shadow uh, by uh, Park Jiun, as you can see here, Yip Wan Yi and uh, Zhuan Anjing. The Shadow, part of the Open Sky Projects of 2016, foregrounded the, the screen's use of monochromatic LED through an interplay between light and darkness. Human figures appear as silhouettes and stretched shadows. The work ends with a dark figure framed by a white circle as if caught in a searchlight running up the building until the effigy disappears and the building is left dark, disappearing as well into the night sky. The creators of the shadow suggested that the shadow was a symbol of freedom as it exists even when no light shines. The relatively simple graphics of the shadow resist any attempt at lifelike images. The animation places the screen in focus as the central, as a central component of the artwork. Here we see the end of the piece, right? The building just disappears into darkness. All these may be considered a preamble for, animation, for animations designed for the ICC facade, which address directly the idea of time running out. For example, Dance with Time, a part of the Open Sky Project exhibition of 2014. Sorry, I don't have a video of that. If anybody has, please let me know. I couldn't find it. This one featured an acrobat dangling off a giant clock balloon. The artists explain time is eternal and therefore the speed of time is relevant. The rhythm of urban people's life accelerates the speed, flies as fleeting. This is especially true, this is still part of the quote, this is especially true in, metro in a metropolis like Hong Kong, and even the clouds are in the rapid flow. The most prominent works addressing the passing of time followed in the footsteps of the Open, Ice project, Open Sky Project, but were not part of it. So first, Art Basel Hong Kong, an annual for-profit art fair commissioned um, Cao Fei's five minute long, same old, brand new, which showed in March uh, 
13th to 17th, 2015. Cao had already, Cao Fei had already used buildings as screens in the virtual world of Second Life. Cao's machinima wanderings in Second Life recorded, among others, in the piece I Mirror of 2017, sorry, 27, um, is among my favorite animations of all time. Same old brand new uncannily re resonates with the virtual buildings that we see here in Second Life. Cao Fei integrates into her work the primitive animations of the early arcade and video games, Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and Tetris. Replicating landmark harbingers of interactive animation offers a media archeological glossary on the interconnected evolution of built environment and digital images. Uh, what I've just shown you, I'll show it again, is just, oh, no, not this one. Um, it, this is just the um, beginning of, or well, oh, you know what? Sorry about that. I have to go back. Yeah, all right. You've just seen what you should not have seen. So ignore what you just, uh, what your eyes have just taken in in the last half minute. Now, um, this is a longer piece, right? I've just shown you a short clip from it, and I'm sure I'm going to show another short one soon. Um, in a forthcoming essay, I explore how Cao Fei explore, um, deploys in this scene, in this uh, work, how Cao Fei deploys the change in size of video games, such as Pac-Man, from the arcade game to smartphone app, and to building size light show. How she does this to comment on mo modern urbanism. So this is part of a big project that Carlos Rojas and Li Jining and I are co-editing as the Oxford Handbook of Chinese uh, Digital Media. Now, as an aside, the trope of Pac-Man Intruding into urban space and taking over the city is not limited to ICC light shows. In 2017, Soto Zen animators created a CGI video titled Pac-Man Giant Robot. It's available on YouTube. Um, it's just too much fun for me not to include some of it. It features a giant three-dimensional Pac-Man hovering over Hong Kong and gobbling metal pellets, as you can see here. Ghost robots give chase, eventually crashing actually into the ICC tower in an urban apocalypse. Now Cao Fei takes the trope of the video game further as her animation begins and ends with writing across ICC. First, are you ready? And last, game over to be continued. These messages designate the limited time during which the building is under the spell of digital mediation, after which both architecture, architecture and animation are going to disappear into the dark night again. Now, such are the ICC displays that mimic video games running out of time until the words, the words game over stretch over the entire facade. The game over moment is, in, is a unique feature of video games, marking the temporal limits of the game and at the same time offering the opportunity for a reset. So the game over trope, maybe I can show this again. There you go. Is of particular relevance to Hong Kong's space time. And I'm sure you're familiar with Akbar Abbas's argument. He has famously argued that Hong Kong has developed a culture of disappearance or politics of disappearance since 1984 due 
um, to um, the impending change of status of Hong Kong and its submission to PRC control. In response, activists produced what Helen Grace calls spectral monumentality, ephemeral memorials to life in Hong Kong and photographs and videos uploaded online. Helen Grace notes that the low resolution look of those YouTube clips, and this is a, uh, you know, old media, older YouTube clips limited by the technology of the um, 2010s, this low re resolution look made each video become a quotation or remediation of some purported record. This is part of Grace's argument. Now, the artworks on the ICC facade may be understood as another form of Hong Kong ephemera, displays limited to a few minutes, exhibited only a few nights before the building went black. The only traces left behind are the recordings still available on YouTube and Vimeo. The contrast between the monumental scale of ICC and the temporary nature of the light show is, I would argue, an apt metaphor for Hong Kong's precarity. In 2016 now, a year after Cao Fei's animation showed on ICC, Art Basel commissioned another work, this time Tatsuo Miyajima's Time Waterfall. The animation consists of digits shaped like a seven segment LED clock display cascading down the facade. Each digit transforms into a countdown from, one to not, uh, from nine to one. Miyajima explains, these numbers symbolize the lives of people. The cycle of life and death continues. Time waterfall exists to allow us to think about the fact that we are living now. Hong Kong is an energetic city where life overflows. This is why the piece is being shown here, that is in Hong Kong. He's actually made other versions of it, smaller versions, but the first one was um, on the ICC facade. Miyajima links the countdown to a Buddhist message about the ephemerality of life, but it's hard to ignore the geopolitical significance of countdown in the context of Hong Kong. Any display of time ticking toward zeroing the clock may resonate with the Hong Kong clock that was placed in Beijing's Tiananmen Square in 1986, a giant digital display that showed a countdown toward Hong Kong's handover in 1997. Similarly, the ICC facade visible from all over the city may establish a public temporality and a common historical reference. Although the ICC light shows rep repeatedly referred to Hong Kong's identity, they kept away from even slightly sensitive issues. After all, the Open Sky Project and Art Basel enjoyed corporate and government sponsorship. As soon as an animation did introduce the historical implications of the passing of time, the ICC light show was curtailed and the Open Sky Project, project terminated. What I'm talking about here is what happened in May, June of 2016. The Hong Kong Arts Development Council organized Human Vibrations, the fifth iteration of its large-scale public media art dis uh, exhibition. One of the works was um, Our 62nd Friendship, begins now. Later, it was renamed Clock uh, Countdown Machine, which is what I call it here, but originally it was called Our 62nd Friendship Begins Now. Um, this was designated for the ICC facade. It's a nine minute long piece, which builds up a repetitive structure. It starts with a tribute to a Hong Kong cinematic milestone and ends with a twist that drives home the political meaning 
of keeping time. So the title uh, refers, the original title, Our 62nd Friendship Begins Now, refers to a pickup line in Wong Kar Wai's Days of Being Wild. Most of you probably know this famous scene played by Leslie Jung and Maggie Jung. Let me see if I have this here. Um, it's coming. We'll um, yeah, this is the scene I'm talking about. The male protagonist, Yadi, convinces a woman, Solai Jun, to look at a watch together for one minute, after which he declares that they have now been friends for that long, for 60 seconds. The ICC light show quotes the film in Chinese and English. Our 60-second friendship begins. Now, I will remember this minute. You can't change this fact. Uh, and this is actually not the image I wanted to show you, uh, but I'll just give it up for now. We'll get, get back to this one. Wong Kar Wai's films often refer to the creation of memories for future reference, a theme that Akbar Abbas has famously linked to Hong Kong's culture of disappearance. The 2016 animation, animation Countdown Machine, which we're seeing here, builds on this trope to comment, to comment on both po politics and mediality. The lines from Days of Being Wild are repeated multiple times interspersed with one minute countdowns using analog and digital clocks. The Chinese stems and branches cycle, circles filling the surface in Tetris fashion. This is what I had here. Let's see it again. Just the end of that uh, building being filled up. Um, and more ways of counting to a minute. The last minute of Countdown Machine shows a somewhat obscure countdown starting at 97901.2496, which the artists explained as indicating the number of seconds left until July 1st, 2047, when the one country, two systems will give way to Hong Kong's complete dissolution into the PRC. As an implied mourning of Hong Kong's disappearance into memory, Countdown Machine was an affront to the PRC and a transgression of ICC's policy that light shows should not include, quote, works containing any political elements, unquote. As soon as Countdown Machine went up, the artists made the political message explicit. They paired the light show with a website, renamed the animation as Countdown Machine, and changed its description to a reference to Hong Kong's, quote, ongoing struggle. They made a press release resulting in coverage by the New York Times, CNN, and other leading world media. As expected, uh, this is not what I wanted again, so I'll leave it for a second. Um, as expected and most likely planned by Wong and Lam, the publicity forced the organizers of Human Vibrations, this larger activity from of which this one was a part, uh, the, it forced the organizers to take down the work after five days, um, followed by accusations of censorship. Hong Kong's art community was largely hostile to Wong and Lum's stint with Countdown Clock. On the one hand, the media campaign misrepresented Hong Kong curators as oppressors. On the other hand, the work incurred the wrath of the sponsors who shut down human vibrations and consequently canceled the Open Sky projects and other related collaborations between art organizations and ICC. The organizers of the Open Sky project, Lisa So Young Pak and Maurice Benayoun noted in this essay that Countdown Machine aimed for a disruptive provocation 
Whereas the Open Sky Project adopted a so-called long-term strategy to counteract the pervasive commercialization of the urban skyline. Pak and Benayoun write of what they call the countdown clock campaign, emphasizing that unlike the self-standing open sky artworks, the visual artifact was only part of a media performance. Indeed, whereas the works under the aegis of the Open Sky Project and Art Basel are um, paradigmatic of the use of urban screens, Countdown Machine introduces a different set of concerns. Animations such as City Path, The Shadow, the same old brand new, evidence the merger of buildings and screens. They iterate the by now somewhat trite adage suggested by Virilio that the immediacy of the digitally mediated time annihilates the perception of space. Countdown clock follows a different logic. It creates a disruption, not in space, but in time. After all, the animation is based on a film by Wong Kar Wai, whom Tony Raines called a poet of time. I actually find it baffling that Countdown Machine took the art community by surprise. Perhaps it's because the curators involved mostly came from other countries than Hong Kong. As in Wong Kar Wai's films, the mention of time running out in Hong Kong is inevitably both an existential uh, or an existentialist and a political statement. Now, I started by my talk by asking at what resolution of time does animation work? The frame, the pixel, the entire video, Equally important, however, are the distinction between medial time and historical time, and the understanding that this distinction is bound to fail. The question I must leave, leave open is, is animation especially equipped to address the political exigency that links between medial time and historical time? The discourse on animation has taken us in different directions. There is a strong tendency to discuss animation as the craft of the single frame, thereby pushing aside the historical time. There is a wide recognition that the animation can easily break the barriers of reality and present fantastic temporalities. Animators and scholars also identify cultural and national characteristics of Chinese animation. So these have been and should continue to be discussed. But what I'd like to see more of is putting these approaches together in various ways, including the question of the relation between animation and the death of the image. So this was rather long. I hope that everybody has managed to uh, stay awake depending on your time zone um and i guess we're ready for discussion thank you uh, thank you so much professor yumi brister since our moderator professor paula Vach is here i will just give the floor to professor paula Vach. please paula Kia ora, everybody, and I have to start with apologies to Yomi, to Daisy, and to all of you. Uh, of course, with technology, you know, everything that can, should not happen, can happen. So yes, I've had, you know, uh, problems, and I missed the beginning of the, of your lecture. So um, I will immediately open, I do have questions based, and I can tell you from when I entered, I entered the, the, the show when you were talking about Lele, uh, so I, my apologies, but I do think you made it very uh, powerfully clear at the end, and I, I know your work, so thank you so much, Yomi, 
and I will immediately open the floor for questions. And of course, in case there is silence, I, as, as usual, I have plenty for you coming for you. Uh, so if I can ask you to raise your hand. Yes, I have already changed you already. Um, and I try to keep the, a view open, uh, but if I miss any hands up, feel free also to open up your uh, audio and just yell out your name. So Chenshu, please go ahead. Thank you, Paula. Hi, Yomi. I mainly just hey, want to say hi. <laughs> and yeah, just say so I, really, I really enjoy uh, hearing your new work. Uh, very provocative, very exciting. Um, I have maybe a rather basic question, clarification question, because I'm not super familiar with animation theory. Um, but as I as I listened on, I started to have questions about what you mean by animation. Mm. Uh, for example, so that, that piece recycled, when I saw that, I my, I had question about whether that's animation for me because the images were were still images, but but they were connected in a way almost like a slideshow. So I started thinking whether slideshows can also be considered animation. Uh, and then when you juxtapose that work with uh, other works like Xu Bing's uh, Dragonfly Eyes, in that case, it seems like the, the definite you were trying to broaden what's considered animation and make a connection between animation and the digital. So at that point, are we still talking about animation or are we talking about the digital media? Or are we talking about digital animation? Uh, and, and then I guess um, bringing back to your main case, which is the Open Sky project. Recently, I have a student who did a project, uh, a video essay that talk about how in the golden age of Hong Kong cinema, there was so much neon in the background, so neon lights, and a lot of these neon had been replaced by LEDs. So, so I was just wondering whether you thought about, I guess, the specificity of LED as a particular medium for animation. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, let me see if I remember all your questions, because there were three, I think. One was the definition of animation, and I am no expert either. Um, and the what I have found looking at various basic definitions, right? I mean, before anybody starts uh, getting too fancy about specific techniques or whatnot, is really that you have one frame made separately from other frames and then the two are put together. So it has um, a, a, well, put together and then a, a lot of other frames, right? Um, so we get a moving image. So usually one thinks of, um, of oh gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Stop what animation? Um, Daisy? Um, stop motion? Stop motion? Stop motion. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Stop motion animation where you kind of take a camera and you take a frame and then you move things around and you take another frame. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, and whether everything that I've shown today is animation is really a, a big question. However, uh, Lele's work specifically has been described by multiple people, including, I think, Paula, Paula here as animation. Uh, Lele is understood as an animator or animator. Um, it's been uh, curated in multiple places is animation. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's animation. Um, the ICC works have been described, at least some of them, by the artists themselves as animation. Um, and I may have other reasons. I, you know, I, I can go ahead and theorize, but I'm less interested you're right in theorizing what is animation rather than interest than what is this mode or method um, that is a much broader one and that is collage uh, the ICC p animations pieces whatever you'd like to call them light shows um, 
are a somewhat different case, but Lele's piece leads us to thinking about this thing that I didn't have not yet developed, but which I wanted originally to develop for this for the talk today, um, thinking about collage. And so not thinking, because the big question about animation is basically, is it a technology? Is it a genre? Is it a, um, uh, what is it? Right, and and it and each resolution gives us a different approach to the subject. So I'm basically trying to leave that aside because that could take us a whole lot of time and 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 no conclusion. That not that we need to have a conclusion, but um, or a resolution. But that's um, the first issue. Um, what is the difference between digital and non-digital animation? Uh, again, this has been discussed in multiple ways. I am specifically interested in where the LEDs um, are, uh, basically LED, at least with current technology, not to mention technology um, of five years ago. LEDs are big. You can't have a smooth image. Mm -hmm. um, what is now done and what was done with urban screens and with LED is now done with what's called project uh, called mapping projection, which is a completely different technology, which does allow for smooth uh, images for much higher resolution, much higher transition. And that is much uh, faster transition and um, and color. All of this is is not true for LED. And as I see it from the very beginning, animators or artists or whatever you'd like to call them were aware of this and used that to their advantage. That is, here is a primitivist um, medium. I hope this answers your questions. Yeah, thank you, Yumi. Sure. Thank you. And I'm just trying to see if there is anyone else with the hand up in the gallery with questions, or if you wanna, you know, yell out your name before I ask a question and I take my privileges <laughs> as the chair, the late chair, <laughs> the belated chair. Uh, while, I, I, while I wait and I'll give you some more time, then maybe Yomi, I can ask you my question. And I, I have a few, but I think I will start with the question of scale. Since I know you have been also working on that and it's probably mm. what, unfair to just bring that in now because you probably decide I'm not gonna go there. But obviously when you talk about, you know, um, objects that are, you, is, yes, they are readdressing the question of what time and space, on the screen itself can be captured or be disrupted, but there is also a question of, of the audience, right? Who is watching it and in which kind of space and scale? And it's very different if you think about, you know, Lele is, of course, um, um, recycled piece, uh, the, you know, Subing's one, the dragonflies, and of course, the large scale on ICC. So, how? The, the scale here in my mind is really important, especially from the perspective of the audience who is watching and who has control over it. Uh, so can you tell a little bit more on that? Um, okay, this is where I said, you know, I uh, I feel intimidated because the person who should talk about it is uh, Chen Shu. But um, um, I definitely think that it, uh, scale matters in a number of ways. And before I get to answering specifically about the pieces that uh, I was talking about today, let me address, as you're right to say, this is also a branch, kind of a stray branch of a larger project in which I'm looking at new media and the scale of new media and how it um, and how new media may mediate scale, specifically uh, at the urban resolution, whatever that may mean. Uh, and there are multiple 
urban resolutions. Um, so what does it take to mediate the city to itself even, right? Uh, we see here a mise en abim, a uh, mediated Hong Kong shown within a mediated Hong Kong and so on. So um, scale definitely matters. Um, we are also to some extent, um, I was going to say led astray, but that's where Chen Shu would be right to say uh, that's not the right word. And actually your work, Paola, as well, you know, about uh, uh, micro videos and so on. Uh, so much of what we're seeing here, we have only seen on YouTube, maybe on my snazzy, beautiful desktop screen, and maybe only on a screen this big on our smartphone, right? And that's also part of the afterlife of these images, and that's important. Um, at the same time, that's not how these works were intended to be seen, right? Or at least some of them. It's interesting because um, Cao Fei made um, two versions, one for ICC Tower and one for the smartphone. But in most cases, you know, even Lele's art, I assume, was meant to be watched in galleries rather than on our little phone, uh, or at least on some, you know, nicer, um, you know, in a somewhat nicer projection environment. And excuse me, I'm still using nicer for anything that's not just a smartphone. Um, and ICC, the ICC light shows, of course, were really tailored, were, were designed for that building. Um, I have not seen any of them in person. There are, though, the, the uh, videos that I showed you and also many others online where you can actually hear the people in the background talking about it. Um, there are also um, specific places that were designated as, as ideal places from which to see the show, especially the small, I forget the, the name of the mall, right across Victoria Harbor from ICC. So, um, so the idea of scale matters. How it matters is what I was trying to probe into here and would love to have a conversation about. Well, look, I, I think because I, I, if I'm correct, the focus on your talk today was specifically on how this digital medium, this animated digital medium disrupts uh, time and space in different ways. Obviously, I think uh, something that uh, is shown on a large scale of, of a skyscraper, but also there is an, a continuous loop that you can keep on watching and rewatching and missing and coming back. It, 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 uh, in, in, time, in terms of, you know, that, that we are running out of time, it seems almost to go against this idea. Yeah, we're running out of time, but we might be actually um, being rather trapped in a loop rather than running out of time. You know, even, even the idea of Hong Kong disappearance, but if you have it on a continuous loop and then there is the possibility of, a, of a starting all over, it's a very, maybe it's an unintended uh, consequence of having this shown on in that con contextual space but you're right you you end up with the building in the black yeah for a few seconds because then it starts all over again so it's game game yeah. over and booting continuously um so yeah very very interesting for me how uh, you know watching those those events um disrupts as i i really i agree with you more than space uh, i really feel it says something else about our perception of time um but sorry i don't want to take over because you know, in no, i do want to i do want to to uh underline what you're saying because i think it's important and i should probably also underline that in my um you know, in the written version of this presentation, which is that we are talking about, let's call it through three different kinds of loops. One is the loop that we have already seen in my presentation, 
right? Which is if you watch this on YouTube or on an academic presentation such as this, eventually it's going to loop around itself pretty quickly. That's not how it's shown, but you're right that eventually it will loop, right? So the open sky um, uh, light shows did not show the same piece over and over right after its uh, original um, um, projection, right? It took a, a little while. It took a, a cycle of, of something like 10, 6 to 12 pieces um, before we got back to it. Uh, but eventually, yes, there was a, a loop, and it's interesting to think about that. Um, I was going to say something else before I get to specifically, and I hopefully I will remember, but the countdown clock. Oh, yeah. And then there is the idea of game over, which is, as I've said, and as you've said, um, is both an end, but also a mark of just, just press the reset button and you're back in, in the game. Um, and then there is this piece, this one single piece, uh, the countdown machine, which has within it a repetition. And it's a very Wong Kar Wai-like repetition. So there's something else going on there, right? And it is, I would argue, indeed, very powerful. It's available uh, on YouTube. Go and watch it, the whole nine minutes of it. You know, it's not a huge time investment. And it's like quoting Wong Kar Wai and then a countdown for a whole minute and then quoting Wong Kar Wai again and another countdown and so on and so forth. That is a very different and deliberate repetition within the work. And I should think more about that. So thanks for the comment. Uh, look, now that you mentioned again, Wan Karwai, just, just to actually also comment on what Chen Shu was asking, what's animation? One way that you can talk mm. about animation is like, you know, making the, if it relates to cinema, it's animation, right? If it's some sort of way, because the, the whole idea of a moving image that started, whether it started with, you know, the live action, Lumiere or the Melier, you know, the whole mythology of cinema, but if it, it somehow, if those of us who have come to animation through cinema studies, you know, there is this strong umbilical cord. It's another way of approaching animation that is not like based on the frame or the resolution or, or the technology, but on using that sort of, same uh, historical or, or aesthetical uh, parameters of references. So one one way that I thought that it was very much, you know, animation style is precisely, you know, when if one Karwai appears in it, it's a strong connection with that space, right? Um, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify that, but it's definitely one of the ways that animation can be theorized. Um, sorry, right, guys. Right, and I, I did, and I did. Let me just. Um... Uh, quickly, so you probably missed uh, the part where I was uh, referring to your essay in Journal of Chinese Cinemas, and in we and indeed the way in which you think of animation as connected to Inxi. Um, and I think that's very much a good point. Um, I wonder how people like Daisy would feel, right? Because if the idea is that there is such a thing as um, uh, animation studies, you know, um, how can Daisy do that without uh, opening it up for anything, any moving image, right? And to some extent, um, I, I don't care, right? I mean, uh, categories are there to help us think through questions, but not to limit those questions. So, um, so yeah, we're, back to square one when it comes to like, or to frame one, uh, is everything animation? I'm not going to answer that. Yeah, neither, neither I will attack. Um, any other questions, please? Uh, I don't really want this to become like a dialogue just between me and Yomi. And I know that there are a lot of, lots of people there that are probably are just being 
um, quiet, but they have more more intelligent things to say <laughs> than I have said so far. <laughs> As an Italian, I always have to fill the void. You know, I'm, we are afraid of you know silence. So please, please raise your hand and have a question. Hey, Paula, uh, if no other questions, may I ask a question? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Yumi, for your wonderful presentation. And I was curious, uh, how is your uh, lecture today related uh, to your previous uh, studies and uh, writings about uh, the city and urban space uh, and how uh, Hong Kong is so special? Maybe you can clarify a little bit. Uh, so the first question is really easy to answer, although I could give you a long version, a much longer version, a yet longer version, and I'll try to be short. Mm -hmm. um, the second one about Hong Kong um, is one that is to some extent entirely serendipitous. That is, I was looking at, um, I was looking at images of, um, well, at urban screens. And mm -hmm. actually, OK, it comes from somewhere else. Let me, OK, I gave you one explanation about the mediation of uh, scale and the way that, as I said, the city may, may be even mediated onto itself, right, and to its citizens through scale. Right, and that's where um, buildings and the scale of buildings becomes important. What also is important, and that is um, you know, where I anchor the uh, argument for the, uh, for the upcoming piece in the Oxford Handbook of, the, of Chinese digital media, is in yet another scale, which is the human scale, right? And we always have to ask, but as I see it, what is, how is the human scale, how are the human scale and the urban scale mediated um, through new media? And so this is where I would go to a piece such as Shadow, right? Which shows the figure of a person on the building. There's, of course, the people in front of the people, the, the building, the, the spectators as well. There, there's so many different versions of human scale and urban scale. So human scales and urban scales that are being mediated. And once I got into that, um, and I don't remember if Shadow, the Shadow was the first piece I paid attention to or what, but it became really important for me to talk about ICC and everything that was happening with ICC because these are variations on the theme in so many interesting ways. Um, now, the one way in which Hong Kong is really important here and there are probably many others, but the one that I that was important that was um, easy for me to latch on to um, is the fact that there is that creative atmosphere, right? I don't see anything like that taking place in the PRC. There are many uh, there are many light shows on buildings in the PRC. Um, uh, very famous ones in uh, in Guangzhou, in Shenzhen, in um, um, I believe Chengdu, or uh, in any case somewhere in Sichuan. I'm pretty sure. This, in any case, they're they're all over the place. That's not um, the issue, but the kind of exploration that was made possible, both because of institutional. Uh, issues such as um, what Hong Kong University was doing um, and, um, sorry, City University of Hong Kong. And um, 
I think that 2014 to 2016 was just an amazing period. Um, I wish it wasn't, right? I wish it didn't have to like uh, counteract so ferociously against something, but there's something to say about, uh, about how politics are wonderful for art. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. So Paula, maybe you are running out of time. Yeah, no, I because I don't know in the end when did you guys start uh, due yes. to my delay. So, but I do think that we are probably out of time regardless right now. So I wanna look, uh, Yami, I, I apologize. I couldn't give you a proper introduction. I'm sure Daisy has. Daisy did, so thank you. Yes, it's been fantastic to listen to you as always, always inspiring. You always have, you know, quite sharp and provocative way of framing things that are always gonna be, I think, useful for anyone, whether you're working in animation or in other area of arts or Chinese studies. So thank you from, from my perspective and thank you, Daisy, for inviting me to chair and everybody for listening and being with us. And again, my apologies on behalf of my computer and my Zoom uh, for, for being late. <laughs> And thank you all. As I already said, you know, I was a bit uh, um, intimidated by the number of people who found this to be uh, of interest to them. I'm glad you um, uh, you all attended. And I, in the last on the last slide, I also showed my um, email. If anybody has comments or questions that they didn't feel comfortable asking in front of any, everybody, I'm always very glad to continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you again so much, uh, Professor Yumi Brewster, and also thank you so much, Professor Paula Vachi, for moderating uh, Yumi's uh, wonderful talk. Uh, this is a gentle reminder that next Monday, we're going to have the second distinguished uh, you know, talk given by Professor Jason McGrath. So I hope to see some of you here. Okay, thank you again. Thank you so much. Bye, see you soon, bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye, Daisy. I'm going to run away to another uh, meeting, but okay, this okay. is great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Bye, Yumi. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.